Well, good morning. Through the summer, uh, my wife and I, we enjoy watching Family Feud, uh, mostly so that we can yell at the screen because we think that we have better answers than the contestants. Saw this the other day. Let's see how well you do. Top five answers are on the board. Name something that people worry about. Out loud. Just name something that people worry about. What do you think it would be? Let me show you the top five answers. They are money, paying bills, children, taxes, and work. Do you know what's interesting about all of those answers? <laughs> They're related, right? Why do I work to make money so that I can pay my bills, feed my kids. And if it weren't for taxes, I'd have even more money so that I could pay my bills and feed my kids. We're looking at resetting some areas of our life this summer and wouldn't you love to push the reset button on stress? Wouldn't you love to push the reset button on the things that you worry about? Why do people even want to get rich. Why do people want to make more money? Why do people want to win the lottery? Is it just because they want to have more money? No, they want to have less worry. We all want to be a little less anxious. Well, guess what? Jesus wants us to be less anxious too. In the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus says, therefore I tell you, do not be anxious about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink, nor about your body, what you will put on. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air. They neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not of more value than they? And which of you, by being anxious, can add a single hour to his span of life? And why are you anxious about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow, they neither toil nor spin, yet I tell you, even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. But if God so clothes the grass of the field, which today is alive and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you, O you of little faith? Therefore, do not be anxious, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For the Gentiles seek after these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them all. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. Therefore, do not be anxious about tomorrow, for tomorrow will be anxious for itself. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. Have you been worried about anything this week? Most of us have. I think if I asked for a show of hands right now, uh, if any of you worried this last week, probably most of us would raise our hands. On top of that, Worry robs us, right? It robs us of joy and it takes away the time and the attention that we would probably better spend focusing on other things in life. Not to mention worry is also a sin. Jesus specifically tells us three times in the Bible not to worry. Why not? Well, because we can't trust God and worry at the same time. Right? I mean, think about it. It's either, the, it's either one or the other. You either trust God or you worry. So what do we need to do? We need to stop worrying. But it's a cycle. It is a cycle. We, we worry about the future, so we work today. And that anxiousness drives us. But Jesus says, don't be anxious. But I, I kind of need that anxiousness, Jesus. I, that's, that's the driving force in me. If, if I'm not anxious, then the bills don't get paid. We all got to eat, right? Besides, do you know who invented work? I mean, who invented work? Where did this idea come from? It's right here in the Bible, in the very beginning. In Genesis chapter 2, the Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to work it and keep it. And the Lord God commanded him saying, you shall surely eat of every tree in the garden, but of the tree of knowledge of good and evil, you shall not eat for in that day that you eat it, you will surely die. 
So in the beginning was work, right? Even before there was sin. There's not even sin yet. Before sin, there is work. Work came first. And Jesus says, don't worry about clothes. Don't worry about food. God will take care of you. God will provide for all your needs. What does that mean? Because, because I know those things are not going to fall out of the sky. What does it mean God will take care of you? My work takes care of me. Jesus says in the Sermon on the Mount that God takes care of all his creation and that we can trust him to take care of us too. That's why 1 Peter 5, 7 says, cast all your anxieties on him because he cares for you. Wouldn't that be great if we could actually do this? Wouldn't it be amazing if you could cast all your anxieties on God? Instead, what do we say? You can't rest, right? We say idle hands are the devil's playground. Or, you know, you'll have time to rest when you're dead. <laughs> Why do we say that? Uh, apparently, we think that uh, we have to wait until we die to rest. When I die, then I'll have eternal rest. We say that when people pass away. We say, now they're at rest. We say, rest in peace. We, do we think that heaven is a vacation? Is heaven a place of rest? The story is told of a man who died and he found himself in some fabulous, abundant place and his every wish was instantly granted. And eventually that novelty wore, wore off and he got bored and he goes and talks to his host and he asks if there's something that he could do. Is there any work he could do, anything he could perform, any problem he could help solve? And his host said, I'm sorry, but there's no work to be done here. No work, the man said in frustration. Nothing to do? He said, I would rather be in hell than have nothing to do forever. And his host replied, just where do you think you are? Revelation 14 says, and I heard a voice from heaven saying, write this, Blessed are the dead who die in the Lord from now on. Blessed indeed, says the Spirit, that they may rest from their labor, for their deeds follow them. Revelation says that we will rest from our labor in heaven. Now, compare that to Isaiah. Listen to how Isaiah describes the new earth, the new Jerusalem. Isaiah 65 says, I will rejoice in Jerusalem and be glad of my people. No more shall be heard in, the, in it the sound of weeping and the cry of distress. No more shall there be in it an infant who lives but a few days, or an old man who does not fill out his days. For the young man shall die a hundred years old, and the sinner a hundred years old shall be accursed. They shall build houses and inhabit them. They shall plant vineyards and eat their fruit. They shall not build and another inhabit. They shall not plant and another eat. For like the days of a tree shall be the days of my people be, and my chosen shall long enjoy the work of their hands. They shall not labor in vain or bear children in calamity, for they shall be the offspring of the blessed of the Lord and their descendants with them. Isaiah is describing work in the New Jerusalem. He describes people building houses, people farming. You read the book of Micah, it says there will be no more sin in heaven. The book of My Micah says that war will cease in heaven. The book of Revelation says there'll be no more tears in heaven, but work will continue. So how can we rest from our labor if we're still working? Well, the word that's translated as labor in this passage in the Greek is the word kopos, Kopos is always used to describe the negative aspects of work. In fact, most cases in the New Testament, when we translate this word, it's translated as trouble or labor or toil. And all of those words have a negative meaning. This is the same word that Paul uses when he talks about how he suffered. 2 Corinthians 11 says, in toil and hardship, 
through many a sleepless night in hunger and thirst, often without food, in cold and exposure. Kopos is the word the New Testament authors use when they want to emphasize the fatigue and the stress that comes with work. Let's not forget there was work in Genesis chapter 2, right? Before there was even sin, which would lead us to believe that there was work before there was toil. There was work before there was labor. Because work is not always toilsome. Work is not always painful. Some of you find it relaxing to work in the garden or relaxing when you work on the car. Some of you know how to work and rest at the same time. So the word rest is not the opposite of the word work. So when Jesus says, therefore I tell you, do not be anxious about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink, nor about your body, what you will put on, Jesus isn't telling us not to work. He's simply telling us not to be anxious about our work. So then where did all this pain and toil come from? Where did the labor come from? Well, it came in Genesis chapter 3. It says, To Adam he said, Because you have listened to the voice of your wife and have eaten of the tree of which I commanded you, that you shall not eat of it. Cursed is the ground because of you. In pain you shall eat of it all the days of your life. Thorns and thistles it shall bring forth for you, and you shall eat the plants by the field. By the sweat of your face you shall eat bread till you return to the ground, for out of it you were taken, for you are dust, and to dust you shall return. Before sin, work was enjoyable. Work was not toilsome. There were no thorns. There was no sweat. Why will work be so much better in heaven? Because the curse from Genesis 3 will be gone. Revelation says no longer will there be anything accursed, but the throne of God and of the Lamb will be on it, and his servants will serve him. Imagine all the things that you love about work. The satisfaction, the sense of progress, the knowledge that you have brought order to disorder. But now imagine that without all of the confusion, all of the sweat, all of the annoyance of work. Now that's a job I wouldn't mind signing up for. So truthfully, it is not rest from work that we desire but rest from toil and frustration and meaninglessness. Jesus says not to be anxious. So how should we work? Colossians 3 says, Whatever you do, work heartily, as for the Lord and not for men. 1 Corinthians says, So whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do all for the glory of God. How would you fill out paperwork if it were God's paperwork? How would you bag groceries if they were God's groceries? Christians should do quality work. And we can then display our love for God, our love for others, by the way that we work. Mark 10, Jesus says, For even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many. We follow a leader who came as an example. He taught us to be a servant. He taught us to be a worker. This is the Lord's message for us in verses 31 through 33. Jesus says, Therefore do not worry, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For after all these things the Gentiles seek, for your heavenly Father knows that you need all these things. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added to you. Okay, so we're talking about pushing that reset button on our anxiousness, our stress. So why does there seem to be a lot of anxiousness associated with work? As we just saw, work does not have to be toilsome. And Jesus promises in the Sermon on the Mount that God will take care of us and he tells us, 
Don't worry. So how do we stop worrying? Well, it's a matter of priorities. There, there can't be two number ones in our life. And just like our discussion that we had about money last week, God wants to be number one. So what's number one in your life? Or rather, who is number one in your life? The only right answer to that question is Jesus Christ. All of us need to put Jesus first in our life. He is worthy of our love. He is worthy of our total devotion. Because Jesus promises in verse 33 that if we will seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, then all these other things, what things? What things? What we eat, what we drink, what we wear, all of the things that we need will be added to us. In other words, the more you put God first, the less we will worry about everything else. One pastor says it like this, worry is the warning light that God is really not first in my life at that particular moment because worry says that God is not big enough to handle my troubles. How do we reset our anxiety? We make God first. And then take trouble one day at a time. Verse 34, Jesus says, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about its own things. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. There is a lot of wisdom right there. Don't worry about tomorrow, because it's more than you can handle. Tomorrow isn't even here yet. So here are four steps to pushing that reset button on anxiety. Number one, live in today. Since worrying about the future, pulls us into the future, nothing will destroy worry faster than to practice being in the present. Psalm 119 says, this is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Take a look at your surroundings by using your senses, the things we see, the things we smell, the things we touch. Reality, <laughs> right? Today is a great tool to pull you into the present moment when all those future worries are trying to bother you. Second, be thankful. Be thankful. You probably already know this, but worry creates negative thoughts and negative feelings, and gratitude does the exact opposite. Ephesians 5 says, giving thanks always and for everything to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Did you know that you can't even think positive and negative thoughts at the same time? So that means that gratitude is the best weapon that you have against worry. Not to mention it's something you can do at any time, especially when you have a couple of minutes. As you look around at the present, Begin listing all the things that you're grateful for. It could be the chair that you're sitting on. It could be the cat that's sleeping at your feet. And before you know it, this feeling of gratitude will replace all the negative that worry causes. Third, you can only control what you are able. Ask yourself, what do you really have control over? What really can you fix? What can you do to prevent whatever you're worrying about from happening? Proverbs 25 says, a man without self-control is like a city broken into and left without walls. Feeling out of control leaves us defenseless. So instead of focusing on what may happen or what could happen or worrying about the unknown, begin to take small steps controlling what you are able. For many of us, worry creates a feeling of being out of control and not safe. So doing things that are within your control helps you to regain those feelings of safety. Last, I would just say pray it out. You know, in science, we learn that if you shine a light on bacteria, it dies. But if you keep it in the dark, it grows. So stop thinking about it or discussing it with your friends. 
Take it to the only one who actually is in control of tomorrow. In fact, the Bible even tells you to do it. Remember, we already read it. Casting all your anxieties on him because he cares for you. How much of your anxiety should you cast on God? All of it, right? Worrying has nothing on you. The next time you find yourself worrying about the future, remind yourself what worry costs you and the joy that it robs you of. Use one of these, or more, or all, of these worry-busting steps. And also remember that you are not alone when it comes to worry. We all do it. But God wants you to be able to have a worry-free existence. He wants you to enjoy your work. He wants you to enjoy your life. Let's pray together. Lord, thank you for these words, for your son that spoke them on the Sermon on the Mount. It's such a long paragraph, and it's filled with your promises, but it begins and ends by telling us specifically not to worry that we can cast our troubles on you, that we can rely on you to supply our daily needs. Even in the prayer you taught us to pray, you said that God would give us our daily bread. Not the bread for tomorrow, the bread for today. Enough for us to trust you and lean on you and to know that you will be there for us. Lord, may we trust you more and worry less. May we love you more and worry less. Lord, teach us not to worry. Guide us towards trust. Guide us towards dependent on you because we are yours. We are your children each and every day. And we thank you for the provisions that you give us. These things we say and pray in Jesus' name, amen. Thanks for hanging out with us this morning. Thanks for watching this sermon. Of course, you could be listening to this as a podcast as well. And I want to remind you that there's a, an address up at the top, a URL. You can always clip and copy that, post it to your own wall, post it to your social media pages, and let your friends and family know what you listened to this morning. Or you could share it with a friend if you think it might help them. Don't forget to like and subscribe to this channel, and I'll see you guys next week. Thanks. Bye.